Can you? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Fantastic. Fantastic. So, uh, do you do you also see this uh, bar here? On the, uh, let me just call it, take it away. This. Okay. I don't know if you can see the zoom bar or if that's uh, of that. If you don't see that, that's fine. So my name is Oski Gunnarsson. Uh, I come originally from Iceland. Uh, as uh, Alde said, I am a Microsoft MVP. I do uh, have been working with Power BI since it started in 2015. And before that with, of course, the predecessor, Power Pivot, Power Query in Excel. And uh, But my background is in uh, in BI in general. So in Microsoft BI, a little bit of Cognos and and you know, a little bit of Click. Um, but I, I, I come from a... a BI development background, so analysis services, reporting services, integration services, and stuff like that. Um, because I come from that background, I'm also used to working on on these kind of you know, bigger projects and the projects that are uh, not necessarily self-service projects. So I've always been really interested in Power BI from an administration and governance perspective because I think that's uh, that's a very often overlooked. Um, so uh, this session is about the Power BI administrator and governance and how that fits all together. So let's just dive in. So the agenda for today is that I'm gonna a little bit talk about the role of the Power BI administrator. Then I'm gonna talk about what the main tasks of that administrator are, and what Power BI governance is, and then how the administrator fits into that governance story. Um, you can, whenever you want, you can, you know, you know, ask a question. You can try shout it out or uh, write it in the, uh, in the, you know, in the chat box. Uh, Aldis will maybe then you know, pass it on if you do. I have a hard time seeing if someone is writing. Um, but you know, if you have any questions, you can wait with them to the end, or you can just you know, interrupt me if you want. So let's dive in. First of all, the Power BI administrator. How do you define it? What did, what does a Power BI administrator do? And if you look at it very broadly, uh, the, the an administrator of a platform is usually responsible for, for the platform itself. So in a legal sense, in a governance sense, in an operational sense. But because Power BI is, even though it's a platform, it's still a, only a part of a bigger platform. So very often, at least where I come, there is not, uh, the Power BI administrator does not have the legal uh, um, responsibility for the platform. They do, however, have responsibility for the governance or the operational uh, the operations of the, of the platform. Um, but if you are a Power BI administrator, I would check, you know, what kind of responsibilities do you have? You know, is there expectancy that you may make sure that everything, you know, is legal in it? And when I'm talking legal, it's, you know, it can be multiple things, but probably in the most prominent is stuff like GDPR and, and other things like that, that could, you know, potentially have legal implication. But more practically, the Power BI administrator is normally responsible for a smooth operation. And monitoring, so making sure everything you know works as it should, and making sure that people are doing only the things that are supposed to, and you know that you can you know say if people are using it or not. So the focus on this is on the last two points, so the smooth operation and the monitoring. So the Power BI administrator is a role in Microsoft 365. So if you are a Power BI administrator, or if you want to be a Power BI administrator, this is a role that can be assigned within Microsoft 365. Um, it is called Power BI Administrator, so it's fairly simple to do. Uh, you need to be a, uh, you know, have a provision to assign roles in Microsoft 365. So normally, an an Microsoft 365 admin, um, or you know, there are a couple of other roles that can do it. But you know, you need to have one of those roles if you want to assign a Power BI Administrator. It is not a, you know, a role that only a single person can have. You can have multiple Power BI Administrator, um, and when you uh, have that role. What you can do is you can see the Power BI admin portal. So there are basically two tools you can ha you have as a Power BI admin. You have the admin portal and you have the REST API. Those are the two avenues you can use to uh, to do administration. Now the Power BI administrator can manage the on-premise data database, sort of, and I will show it to you later on what the power manager, the administrator can and cannot do. Although very often the, the administrator is responsible for the gateway, it is, it's not something that comes with a role. And they can manage capacities. So they can manage the you know, manage settings in the portal. They can somehow just a little bit manage the, the, the gateway and they can manage capacities. And I'm gonna go now through- A question. Yep. 
a question from my side. What is, uh, is, is there a difference of administration capabilities between versions like premium and pro? Yeah, so that's mainly in the in the capacities part. Well, th th it is there. That's the only difference, you know, because if you are a uh, if you are a, a Power BI administrator in a in a, you know, a premium environment, you will have you can manage more in the capacities. I, I will I will get to it later uh, what I will talk about the capacities and what and what you cannot do uh, with when it comes to that. But otherwise, it's 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 basically the same thing. You can just get one more menu that opens up for you. Okay. So when you're administering Power BI, I say you have this, you know, three things you can administer. You can administer the tenant, the capacity, the gateway, sort of, and you can do monitoring. And monitoring is usually done through the REST API. And I will, I will come to that a little bit later on. So let's take them one by one. First of all, it's the tenant uh, administration. But the weird thing about it is because this is a uh, this is called tenant administrator and administration and we always talk about it as that but it really isn't a tenant administration because a tenant is a much larger thing than just power bi a tenant is a you know, whole thing that includes subscriptions so you have a tenant and in, in that tenant you have subscriptions and one of those subscriptions is power bi another one could be office 65 uh, you know, another one could be, uh, you know, Active Directory. So there could be different kind of, you know, subscriptions within the tenant, and Power BI is only part of it. So because of that, the Power BI administrator, of course, only has a subset of the tenant settings. So they cannot go in and do, you know, uh, global tenant settings. They can only do the Power BI part of the tenant settings. And that's where, you know, you can do that within the Power BI admin portal, because that holds the tenant setting available to the, to the administrator. Now, in the next few slides, I have a, a list of the settings. You know, I will share the slide with you. I'm not going to read this up for you, uh, but I have a list of the different, you know, portions of the tenant settings, uh, and you know, and the description of what they do. So I'm just going to go and you know look into it now. Uh, but you, of course, you will get the slide, so you can read over this when when you you want. So let me go up here. So here I am logged into uh, into uh, Power BI, and I'm logged in as an administrator. And when I go to uh, the uh, the settings, I have the option here of the admin portal. And if I click on the admin portal, I will have a, you know, a bunch of settings. And each one of these here has a, like a subset of settings underneath. So the first one is a user metrics, usage metric. And I just want to touch on this just, just very briefly, um, because you know, this often causes confusion. This will tell you an overview of uh, you know, what is going on in your tenant. It's something you cannot edit. It's a data set you cannot get hold of. So this is what it is, and you cannot do anything with it. And if you harvest the audit log and want to do a monitoring in that way, don't be surprised if there's a slight difference between that and this. There is something that does not come up here. Uh, Microsoft has been very vague about what it is, and it's it's not going to be harmonizing completely. So just you know, don't expect it to be. You know, you can then you can. Uh, that you can take your the, the data from the audit log and try to somehow compare it to this to make sure if you got it right. You know, it's always going to be slightly off. And there's also a delay in here that is not in the yellow one, even though there's a delay there as well. So uh, just just keep that in mind. But it's a great overview if you just want to see you know what is going on. The users is an is an example of things that you know there are tenant settings, but it's not a part of the Power BI tenant settings because the Power BI administrator does not have any. Uh, any kind of you know uh, licensing, they don't have any kind of uh, cannot you know manage users because that's in Active Directory, so all that lies in a different place. So the the Power BI administrator is does not have a lot to say about security of the uh, of the tenant of the Power BI tenant, except in a way they can close off settings and open settings, but they don't have any you know any uh, influence over. You know who sees what, and you know what type of user, whose licenses, or anything like that. So that's something that's completely different place. If you have uh, enabled Premium Pro user, it will come here. Um, it's going to be interesting, you know. So I'm going to throw out the one question now. You can just you know type the answer in or uh, or shout out if you want. But it'd be very interesting to know if uh, if any of you have enabled Power of you know, a Premium Pro user. So that would be. Fantastic if, if you just you know write yes uh, or no, and then we can count them up at some point, uh, because it is a very interesting offer, and of course it's free at the moment. Uh, 
but then of course it will cost money at some point. But it's a great opportunity to test premium, you know, uh, cap, you know premium capabilities for uh, for free. But just be uh, just be sure that this will cost something at some point that is in, in the near future, and you will have to be able to go back if you uh, if you if you if you are unsure that you know if you don't want to pay the the price. But of course we don't know the price yet. So we have three yeses already. Okay. Question: What it what it is exactly? Yeah. So, premium user is a yeah. Let let's let's back up a little. So you have two kinds of subscri subscriptions for Power BI. You have you know per user subscription, which is normally Power BI Pro. So you pay for every user that that looks at and shares the content you know that is not in my in my uh, workspace. So everything is not in my workspace. You need a license, and it's normally a Power BI Pro license, which is paid per user. Then you have Power BI Premium, which is not paid by user, but it's paid per capacity, which means that you will buy access to hardware. And when you have that access to hardware, uh, developers who need to have a pro license, who need to be you know, per user license as well, they can share uh, the, the reports with everyone that don't, don't have a license. So you can either pay per user or you can pay per hardware. And so you know, the general consensus, if, you, if you're just looking at cost, nothing else, you need to have around 500 users to justify the cost of the smallest premium capacity. Now, because this is a sort of big difference between, you know, I want to, you know, I'm paying per user for 100 users, or I want to have, you know, premium, which is, you know, breaks even around 500. There was all, all this, um, always a, a, a request that, you know, some of the capabilities you get with premium, they could be transferred over to, uh, to the Power BI Pro. Because not only do you get to be able to share with free users with the Power BI Premium, you also get paginated reports, which is the old the reporting services. You can you know, refresh 48 times a day. You get AI capabilities. So you get all kind of things with premium that you cannot, couldn't get with a Power BI Pro. So Microsoft decided to come with something in between. So it's still a per user license called Power BI, they call it called premium per user, but it has all the premium capabilities. And now, you know, you can get your guess is, is you know, good as mine is what it's going to cost. You know, Power BI Pro costs $10. Premium cost a minimum of five thousand dollars per you know per year per month, and then you know what this is going to cost. Who knows? Uh, but it's free for now, and it's probably going to be free for the next couple of months at least, at least another next month I would think. Uh, and then you can try it out to see you know if the the premium features is something you want to pay extra for. If you are going to try pro a premium per user, know that you know if every user that creates and consumes content that is created by a premium per user will need to be premium per user. So you cannot have one user that's premium per user, make that them create paginated reports and share them with Power BI Pro users. You cannot do that. So everyone needs to have it or nobody has it. So that is going to use the, that those resources. It's the same thing as with Pro. So uh, just be aware of that. Um, these, uh, these settings you have here for premium per user are uh, you know, fairly you know, small settings, but it's very similar to what you have when you have Power BI Premium. So you have, you know, something about auto refresh. How do you, how often do you want to have to have that? And then you have the data set workload settings. Here you only have XML endpoints, which is also a great, you know, thing about uh, Power BI Premium, which you will get with Premium User. But when you are in in, in real Power BI Premium, you also get uh, the opportunity to set, you know, how much of my, um, how much percentage of my capacity should be put into uh, AI and how much capacity should be put into uh, into data flows and, and stuff like that. You cannot set that here, uh, but if you are a Power BI, in Power BI Premium, you, you can set those things as well. Because there you have a dedicated hardware. Here you don't have a dedicated hardware. You just have the capabilities. And Microsoft have announced that they will come soon with Premium version 2. And it's already there. You can exactly enable it if you have Power BI Premium. But if you do that, it changes the whole, you know, instead of having a dedicated hardware, you're gonna have a dedicated CPU, uh, and then you know your memory is gonna be. So if you buy eight gigabyte of memory uh, with Power BI Premium in the new version, you will get a minimum of eight gigabytes. That you know you can have so each data set can be eight gigabytes, instead of having you know before it was the total could be eight gigabytes. Now each data set can be that. So it's much more flexibility for refreshes and and you know having you know bigger data sets in and out of memory. But you know you don't get the dedicated hardware anymore, which could you know potentially have that noisy neighbor effect where you know people are you know 
you know, interfering with each other, you know, because everyone is running at the same time. But otherwise than that, uh, there are a few other settings that I, I don't want to go through all of them. I want to go to the, those that are really, really interesting. So one of them, of course, is audit logs. You should definitely turn them on. You cannot do that here. It's, the, it's also a Microsoft 365 uh, uh, thing. If it is turned on for, for uh, Office 365, it's also turned on automatically for Power BI. The logs are stored in, in, uh, in the Microsoft 365 uh, Security and Compliance Center, but you can have access to them within the Power BI REST API for the last 30 days. So you can get the log for the last 30 days there. If you can, can get access to the Microsoft 365 Security and Compliance Center, you can get 90 days. Well, uh, by default. Okay. Sorry, yeah. Alger. We we have a question in in chat. Yeah. So I could read it, or you could. Hey, please go ahead. Yeah. A question from Yanis. We had problem with getting to audit logs. It was hard to grant only Power BI related audit log permissions. Yeah. So that we don't have too much permissions as audit logs was whole Office 365. Yeah. So that is true. Uh, if you want to get access to the audit logs in Microsoft 365. The only way you can get access if you can access to all the audit logs. So every single audit log there is. Uh, so SharePoint audit logs, you know, file share audit logs, you know, exchange audit logs, all those things that you know normally you you know you don't want to give a Power BI administrator that that kind of uh, access. So it's very difficult to get. So that is why Microsoft have de decided to uh, have a REST API endpoint in the Power BI admin uh, API, uh, which is called Get Activity Events. And if you use that one, you can go on and, and it will fetch the can fetch up to the last 30 days order log. So I actually have uh, it open. I can just quickly show it here. So here I so here I have a, a PowerShell, and I have a, I'm, and I'm using the uh, invoke Power BI REST method, and I have the URL to the uh, to the endpoint, and I'm taking one day. So I'm using the activity events uh, endpoint. I'm saying you know take the 26th of January, from midnight. To to uh, to 11. Normally, I would have this you know, 23, 99, 99. I was just you know, experimenting, and now it, it shows it has you know gives me the uh, the all the events. This is a JSON that comes out of it, and then you can output that JSON to uh, you know to a file or, or you know parse it in some way. So this you don't you only have to be a Power BI administrator to use this. You don't have to be a you know a Office 5 or any kind of uh, uh, rights there. But again, so the, the drawback is that you will only get the last 30 days. So if you are interested in, in collecting the audit log, I would uh, definitely start collecting it right now uh, because uh, 30 days you know, is quick to go. And you, then you can you know, start collecting it, putting it into a database, and then you have start growing it. Best, of course, if you can get at least someone from the Office 5 team to, to maybe export the first 90 days to you, and then you can start from with the Power BI REST API to, to get the rest of it. Yeah, we have <clears throat> another question. So Yanis continues asking, uh, you have to activate admin role before this? No, you don't have to. As soon as you, if you're a Power BI admin, you can just go on and, and fetch this. Um, so what do you, what do you, if you want to use PowerShell for example, which I like, you know, you just need to uh, use the, uh, there is a, uh, the, you need to download the, the, the uh, the appropriate, yeah, but, uh, yeah. Um, uh, I don't know, maybe this is uh, our comp company specific, but uh, always that uh, if, if I want to do anything as admin, Power BI uh, admin, then I have to go to the uh, Azure portal, activate the role. Uh, it's active for eight hours, and only then I see all these admin features after the activation. This was uh, what I meant by do I have to activate. But maybe this is just our company policy. Yeah, that, 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 that sounds like something I have never heard of that because uh, if you have the role, uh, you should be able to use the REST API. Are, are, you, uh, are you talking about the REST API or about the uh, admin uh, settings in, within the Power BI tenant? Uh, admin settings in Power BI tenant. I haven't tried these uh, APIs uh, to use. I haven't tried these ones. Okay, so I, I, I think then maybe they, uh, they must just you know, uh, disable your, you know, the, the, uh, the role after eight hours automatically, which is you know which is odd, but you know I can I can see why that may, you know it could be make could make sense. I also have a customer that you know resets the password for the admin every every day, so you know there, there are there are very security conscious companies out there. But I would assume that you will need to then do it as well for the API. 
Yeah, and there another question. What modules do we need to use this in PowerShell? It is called uh, Power BI um, administration. So let me just, you know, so it's, it's, I can never remember this. Yeah, uh, Oscar, I, I need to say you have extraordinary amount of questions. So unprecedented. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, okay, that's good. <laughs> yeah, it's good. It's good. So you can go, if you Google Power BI REST API PowerShell, you can go in here. And then there's uh, you know both part download and documentation. And if you go to the documentation part of the PowerShell, uh, then you would see this is what the one you want is Power BI, Max Power BI management. And, and this one will include all the libraries, you know, all the commandlets you need for uh, to, to call uh, the REST API admin part of it, and uh, including the uh, activity events. And uh, you know, I can uh, I can just drop this in, into the uh, into the chat. Where is the chat here? Blah, blah, blah. Chat. I can just uh, put it in here, and here someone might be able to use it. And I can drop this one here as well. And then yeah, hopefully you can uh, you can benefit from that. And harvesting the audio log is one of the most important thing an administrator should do because you know, not if you are responsible for it. If someone does something, you know, if there's a breach or something happens that our people are unsure of, having the audit log to to uh, to back up your your you know uh, that you had things you know uh, correctly or you can prove someone did something or you can disprove something, that is really really uh, beneficial. Of course, you can you know they can you know if something happens you can go to the Office 65 admins and ask them to check. But having the logs for a longer period of time is something that is really, really beneficial. And there's a gold mine of data in there as well to, to just to look at uh, the activity. You know, how, how what is being used, what is not being used. You know, if you have Power BI Pro licenses, you know, if there's there might be users who have license but never use Power BI, then you can you know, move the license over to someone that would benefit from it. So there's all kind of different things you can do with this data that is not just you know. Uh, you know, auditing, you know, in a sense of, you know, proving if someone did something that, you know, they shouldn't be doing. But, you know, you just write that it is, it is difficult, but, you know, luckily the, having the uh, REST API does actually quite help uh, you to, to, uh, to get to it. Um, the most important part of the administrative work uh, goes through uh, the tenant settings and uh, these settings are, I think there's something like 40 or something settings in here. Uh, they are, uh, there's quite a bit of them. Some of them can be a little bit hard to understand, but what I always recommend to my customers and, and, and to everyone who I, who I talk about these things, and I try to talk about this a lot, this is one of the things I really like, is that you should, as an administrator, you should go in here, you should look at each and every one of these settings and you can you should make a conscious choice of each and every one of those. I would recommend that you also write it down. And I know this is really boring because there's no way to fetch this out uh, automatically via an REST API or anything like that. You just have to write it down. So I have a document template that I use that I said each and every setting is and then what is set to. And the reason why I think you should write it down is that especially if you have more than one uh, administrator, um, you can, you don't, you don't, if someone changes something, you, you will see it in the audit log that something was changed or this was changed and it was changed to something, but you don't see what it was changed from. So if you are, uh, you know, if you have multiple administrators, someone changes something and you don't know what it was supposed to be, then you need to go through all the process again of, you know, figuring out what it was supposed to be. If you write it down, you can, you know, both, you know, for auditing purposes, show what it's supposed to be, but also, you know, help you if you need to set it back. Now, there are a few things in here that are more important than others. Uh, more, probably the one of the most important is a little bit down here. It's called you know, uh, export and sharing. Um, there is nothing really here I can tell you you should do. I, 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 am, uh, uh, I am always following the, the path that you, know, you shouldn't close things down unless you uh, have a good reason to do. So I'm generally an open up things. But you know, there, you know, if you go through them, you know, each one, then you will uh, make a you know informed decision of you know if they should be open or closed. There are a few things in here I just want to point out just because I think they are really interesting. Of course, you know, one of the most talked about is publish to web. It's off by default, um, and it probably should be off unless you have a very specific use case for it. Then you should turn it on, because if something is you know is published to web, it is it is 
published to the whole wide world. So you need to be need to consider that. One. But it's it, it's everywhere. Everyone talks about it. This is one is 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 known to almost everyone. But there are a few others that are really interesting. So out to out here at the top, I really like this one here. So the publish get help information. If you put something in these uh, in these uh, fields here, so training documentation, discussion forum, licensing request, and help desk, what happens is that when someone looks at a report and they go to go to the uh, to the help and support here, these uh, these URLs they are actually replacing whatever is in here. So if someone presses get help, they are going to go to my internal page instead of going to a micro page. And this can be very very useful if you want just want to you know direct people in the right direction instead of you know directing people to some micro support places you know go go to an internal if you have any internal supports for example help desk and licensing request it's really really you know helpful for people to know how to do that so uh, this is something that are all too uh, way too few you know organizations use um there are a few other things in here but there are most of them you know will 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 be just you know some things that you will uh, you will know, and uh, one thing I just want to say is that uh, Microsoft did a quite a big change lately. I just want to go back up here, sorry, uh, to the export and sharing settings here. So if you had set all your settings to something specific uh, more than a month ago, go in and check because these are a bunch of these are new here. Uh, they split out, so it used to be very few settings about sharing. It was like, you know, do you want me to share? Uh, you know, can I export to Excel? Can I, you know, connect to uh, uh, connect to on-premise data sets and, and different things like that? Uh, but the problem was that some of those uh, settings they closed off or opened up much more than the name gave away. So you know, you turned one setting off and it it, it you know stopped uh, analyzing Excel, even though that was not you know nothing you know you thought it would do. Now they have split it up into much more you know, many more settings, meaning that you know each setting has a better granularity. But you need to go through them and again and, and check to make sure that they, they are all set as, as you want them to be. Um, there, is a, um, there is a setting here called create audit logs for internal audit activity. But if your uh, if your Office 365 people or Microsoft 365 people have turned on auditing, this will be grayed out like here because this is on by default in uh, Microsoft 365. If it's not on there, you can turn it on here, but I don't. I haven't met any organization yet that this was not grayed out because everyone has turned it on in Microsoft 365. But if you had, if you only have Power BI, don't have a lot of Microsoft 365, you might need to turn this off to to start auditing, uh, to start collecting the audit logs. Okay, so I don't want to dwell too much on this. Um, there are a couple of things here uh, that that could be that is really interesting here down here. So the admin API setting is something I, I would recommend that you take a look at. Um, so what this is, is that you can create a service principles and you can allow them to use the uh, admin API, the, one, the REST API I showed you before. Um, instead of having you uh, using a Power BI administrator username and password when you are using, uh, for example, uh, PowerShell or something else to call the REST API, you can create a service principle instead, put it into a role uh, add, add them in here, and now they can do a read only of those uh, uh, of those admin APIs. So they cannot uh, change things, uh, but they can uh, they can read things. So this is a, a more secure way of doing things instead of uh, instead of uh, using a username and password. So you just have a client ID and a secret instead. Um, so I, I recommend that you do this instead if you want to put up some kind of a you know automated monitoring, uh, which which I recommend that you do. Okay, so these were the most important tenant settings. But my main, or the main message to you now is that you know, go in here, look at each one of them. So you just take each one of them, write it down, and say, okay, what should this be from my organization perspective? Set it to that, and then you know, write it out, write about the setting down, and then keep that somewhere in a good place. Now there are a few other things in here that I think are are interesting. Uh, this is, of course, the main things in the tenant settings, but there are other things that are there are that could be potentially interesting. So one of them is the organizational visuals. If you are in an organization that is is very tight on security, you might not allow all uh, you know all uh, custom visuals. But what you can do instead, you can put in here the all the allowed ones, and then when you have put all the allowed ones in here, they they can be used, but none of the others. You need to in the tenant settings you can you can have a setting that says you can only 
you only want to trust those who are in the in the store here, but you don't want to trust all the ones that are on the uh, on the in the Microsoft uh, store, uh, all the custom visuals there. This is you know generally speaking, I'm a big fan of custom visuals, so I you know if 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 you can have this open, it would be good. But if you want to control it, this is the way to do it. Um, another interesting thing for a Power BI administrator is this workspaces here. So this is a list of all your workspaces. But what is interesting about it is that, generally speaking, uh, the administrator does not have any access to any workspaces that they have not been given explicit uh, access to. So if you haven't explicit access, you don't have access. Here, uh, sorry, you, yep. sorry uh, we have a question about visuals. Yeah. If, if I add visual here, can I use it in desktop? Yeah, so, we, so you, it's very hard to prevent people to use them in desktop. You can prevent them to use it in desktop. It was just gonna—it's just gonna fail when you uh, when you publish it. It's gonna fail to load. So it's it's a very soft band. It's it's not the best you know solution, unfortunately. Uh, if you want to prevent people to use them in Power BI Desktop, uh, to use certain visuals in Power BI Desktop, you will uh, you will need to do a group policy on uh, and and push it out to computers. There you can that way you can control what they can use in Power BI Desktop, but. Otherwise, in that day, we can use everything in Power Desktop, but then it's just gonna, you know, say computers has no when they, when, you, when they try to look at it in the in the in the Power BI service. It would, of course, be best if they would just be advised when they are publishing, but then unfortunately, that's not, you know, how good it is. Hope that answered the question. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I think so. And we have another question from Aldis. Aldis, could you please uh, ask it in in voice? So, just to be. Yeah. To understand it correctly, yeah, we are provided uh, uh, some services for our clients, and uh, for better delivery, the information we use the Power BI. We create a report, and they uh, can check those reports by themselves. The, 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 the question is how we can share those reports to our client if they don't have the Power BI Pro license. Yeah, so you have you have you have basically two options to do it. Um, you can either uh, buy them a license or make them buy a license. <laughs> that is one way, uh, and the other way is to use Power BI Embedded uh, or Power BI Premium. Uh, if you use Power BI Embedded, you can get it at all reasonably priced, but then you need to build whatever you know. Uh, you know, around it, you know, build some kind of a you know portal or something that you know you don't get these. Power BI portal with if you buy Power BI and embed it, but then you are buying basically buying a capacity and building something yourself. You could buy Power BI Premium, as I said, five thousand dollars a month minimum, uh, and then you can share it with everyone uh, and they can use the Power BI portal. So these are your three options: uh, buy license, Power BI embedded, or Power BI Premium. And I say most organizations, you know, in your position will buy Power BI embedded and then build some kind of a web portal around. Uh, Around it to help people navigate between reports or or help them look at the reports, but it's it's not trivial. You will need to of course do some programming. Does it does it answer the question? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So what I was saying about the workspaces is, uh, as, as the Power BI administrator doesn't have access to a, to any workspaces they haven't gotten explicit access to, they can it can be a little bit hard sometimes to do some you know uh, some administration. But as an administrator, you can go in here and you can actually add yourself to all workspaces or whatever. You know, you can go and find the workspace and add yourself to it or add someone else to it. And this can be very useful if you need to support someone. Of course, you know, this could also be abused, but uh, you are an administrator, you have those privileges and you need to be careful with them. Um, the edit button here will just allow you to edit the uh, name and some of the uh, uh, metadata about, so you cannot you know, edit the content of the workspace. But of course, if you give yourself access, you can do that. But there are more than one type of workspaces. There are uh, you know, basically three types of workspaces. Oh, I cannot do it like this. There is a workspace, which is uh, the modern workspaces. We have groups, which are the, uh, the old 365, no, so type one group. So it's the Office 365, uh, workspaces, the old type. Uh, hopefully, all of you are stopped using those now. Um, even though it's still possible, they are uh, um, the problem with them is they are tightly co coupled to Office 65, which makes, the, makes it really hard to do any kind of a, uh, you know, maintenance in one place. Uh, it doesn't affect the other one. And the third uh, type is a personal group, which is basically my workspace. Um, 
and you can you cannot edit you cannot add yourself to a, per, in a personal group you cannot do anything about uh, my workspaces as an administrator you are completely locked out of those if someone creates something in my workspace shares it with others and then leaves the company the only way you can get access to that is by logging in as them that's the absolutely the only way uh, and you need to check with all the legality of that before you do it so just make sure that you know if someone has you know something in my workspace they shouldn't be sharing it out from there they should actually be putting it into a regular workspace so just 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 keep that in mind you cannot put yourself into those you cannot do anything you cannot add yourself to the office 65 groups as well because they are office 65 groups and the security is controlled from there but everything it says called the workspace which is all the modern workspaces you have control over access to those uh, you know, as, a, as an administrator okay there's one more thing here I want to mention before I move on, and that's the featured content. It's a you know fairly newish uh, thing in Power BI, which is a really uh, a smart thing. So you can in the, in the in the tenant setting you can decide who uh, who can do feature content. You can submit it everyone, or you can certain uh, certain groups of people. When a, when a person has the ability to do featured content, what they can do actually they, they can promote uh, a report or a dashboard or something like that. And it will then uh, to certain groups of people, and it will feature up here. So if you have access to the, the featured content, it will come up here in the home, and it will be like uh, you know, see this, this is new, or this is something that you should be aware of. Um, and this can be very very useful uh, if you want to you know allow power users or administrators to promote something specific, so that people you know if there's a new uh, you know new development going on, so people can then notice it better. If you don't want to just push it to them with links. So this is something that I, that I think is is a is a good uh, good addition, and it's it's like fairly new, and I don't see many people use it, but it's very very useful. Okay, so these were the tenant settings. Um, so hopefully it made a little sense. Like I say, I have all of them written down here, and ho uh, all the categories, uh, and you know, it's something hopefully you can uh, you can uh, read and 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 get something from. Okay, uh, so, sorry, yeah, we can, yeah. we have a question. Yeah, maybe it's uh, could be yeah. Uh, how can we see reports which are published to the web without knowing the link? Meaning, if I publish a report to the web, how can someone without link see or find it? So, yeah. is it secure? It is not secure. Ab absolutely, definitely not. Um, so, I, it was actually a good question because I was just going to come back in here to talk about them in our published web. So, here I have something called embed codes. So, these are all my uh, published to web uh, uh, reports. It could also be other um, embedding uh, you know, reports. It doesn't have to be published to web, but most of this is normally published to web. What I can do here is I can you know, view it or I can delete it. But the question was, uh, how can someone find it? You know, Because they need to have the link, right? But the problem is that uh, the search machine have, they have started to, uh, uh, to categorize them and to troll them. So you can actually Google those things. Um, I have seen a report of uh, published web reports that uh, that just were found on Google, and they were pretty damning, and it was uh, was not something that you want to have on the internet necessarily. So don't try to use you know, published to web as a way to circumvent the licensing, because it's absolutely not secure. If you want to do published to web and uh, and you don't want it to be found, you will need to change the link. You know you can delete the link and create a new one. You know very regularly, and uh, even then you cannot be a hundred percent sure that Google doesn't find it very soon or Bing doesn't find it, you know, and people stumble upon it for some reason. There, of course, is this, the, the, the likelihood is not very huge, but it can happen. So I, I, would, I, would not, um, I would not do it. So let me just, you know. Yeah, and we have question, I suppose, about this uh, uh, Power BI uh, Pro per uh, user, yeah. uh, pre premium, user premium. Yep. By the way, how long do you think the free trial of Power BI Premium, I think, will last? Yeah, so the Premium user, uh, if I had to guess, and I don't know, so I'm, it's just guess. If I had to guess, I would I would probably say at least uh, you know, to the end of February, maybe even longer. But uh, I, I would guess the end of February, we will know at least uh, how long it will, will last. Um, but it will be short. Sounds like it will be short. Oh, well, it has been, and it has been there for two months already. So it, it's actually, or three months already. So it's actually, uh, it's not that not a short uh, preview, uh, but it's not not very long yet. That's my guess. It could be long, a little longer. 
Um, but you know, you know, Microsoft also have, have the rights to charge for their services, and I know I think you know. Uh, if you wanted to try this out, as you know, while it's free, I, I would do it sooner than later. Please. Okay. So, as I said before, just to recap here, making for decision all the settings. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, you you are searching this Google thing for the publish to web. Like, how yeah. do you find the reports? Kind of a thing. Yeah, so so I was I was just trying to search for the uh, for the report of the reports or oh, they will publish the web, um, but you know I, I don't have time to read it now. But uh, you would find it by you know if you were googling something that is just a keyword in that you know in that report, it might be found in that way. So uh, because it's 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 you know it's categorized like every other web page. Um, and you know, and Google does actually troll the whole thing, and you know, we'll get a bunch of metadata about it. If you Google something about it, you know, maybe you know, sales report or something like that, it might just come up in the search. Uh, if you, you know, would say, you know, if you have, you know, your company name and sales report or something, or an annual report, or it might just pop up in the search uh, results. So that that can happen because it's been it's been categorized and and, and trolled like all the others. So that, that that's how and and it's just very important that you are that you know the, the the it's absolutely a risk so i would never trust it to but the, even though the likelihood is small you cannot you cannot know yeah thank you you're welcome so yeah so i have gone through this i don't want to spend more time on it just to you know make you know make an informed decision and make sure that you document all of it so I just want to talk about, touch really briefly on capacity, even though uh, I don't know how many of you have Power BI Premium, if any of you, um, but I just want to touch on it because it's it's just a good to, good thing to know. If you have you know, Power BI Premium, as I said before, you have a capacity, you have you know bought a, you know access to hardware, and now I'm talking about the Gen 1, so the one that is now running, um, you can have switched over to Gen 2, that's in preview still. Um, just make sure if you want to, if you are running Power BI Premium, if you switch over to Gen 2, it is in preview, things can happen. Um, but if you have Gen 1, um, there are things that the administrator can do and then things that the administrator cannot do. So first of all, the administrator does not buy uh, capacities. That's done in uh, Office 65 or in Azure if you want to, if you're doing Power BI Embedding. Resizing and setting region is also done in 365. So you can set a region for a capacity. Um, there are there are companies that decide to buy one capacity in the U.S. region and one in Europe because they want to you know keep the data in certain areas. So this is the things that you know that you can do with with uh, you know, premium capacity. But that is you know those kind of settings are also done in Microsoft 65. You know the Power BI administrator does not have access to do anything like that. What the administrator can do about capacities is they can uh, assign users, so they can say that user A is allowed to add uh, workspaces to this capacity. They can also do workload settings, so they can decide, you know, how much how much big percentage of the workload will, will should go to data flows or should go to, uh, you know, AI capabilities or should go to, uh, you know, different things. Uh, if you want to enable uh, XMLA endpoints for read or for write or for read and write, um, you can restart the capacity. It does happen occasionally, you know, if a server goes, you know, goes a little uh, stale and then you can need to restart it. Although I have, I have, I have never had to do it myself, even though I have worked with premium for a while. You can assign capacities yourself instead of assigning users who can sign a capacity. You can also go to yourself as an administrator. Just be aware that there are things that you know, even though you buy a premium capacity, there are things that are not going to be put into that capacity on that server. Um, so Excel workbooks. I don't know if any of you use that. I don't use it myself, but it is there. Push data sets, streaming data sets, and Q and A is all outside of the capacity. So this is especially important if you decide to buy a capacity and put it into a specific region because you want to keep the data in that region. These things are going to be just in your default region. These uh, these four things there. So be be aware of that if you are if you're running you know capacity and you want to you know and you are doing this uh, geofencing here to make sure that the people data doesn't go out outside of the the region. Okay, that was capacity. Oh, sorry, there was one more. I want to talk about. Uh, I think I must have hidden the slides, which is the uh, uh, the gateway. So 
if I go back to my Power BI here, so a Power BI administrator does not necessarily have access to a gateway. Um, it might be that the Power BI administrator set up the gateway, but if they did not set up the gateway and have not been explicitly given access to the gateway, they don't have the gateway. So here I'm logged in as a Power BI administrator that has, uh, that has set up the gateway. So I can go here and I can go to settings and I can go to manage gateways. And I will, I will see my gateway in here. So I have a gateway here and I have another gateway here. This one doesn't work, but this one it does work. Um, and it's all running, everything is good. And you know I can see everything here. Here I'm logged in as an administrator that does not have, you know, has, that didn't set up the gateway and has not been explicitly given uh, access to the gateway. There's, there's still an administrator. So I can still go to settings and I can go to the, so oh, come on, I can go to the admin portal and I can see all the tenant settings. So I, I am a fully flat administrator. But if I, when I go to manage gateways, I don't see anything. So just be aware of this, that there is no automatic connection between an administrator and a gateway. The gateway is a separate service that is not necessarily linked to that. However, and this is one is really weird, if you go to the Power Platform Admin Center, which is not the Power BI Admin Center, but the Power Platform Admin Center, which is admin.powerplatform.microsoft.com, go to the data, you will actually see the gateways. And I can actually go in here and I can manage users and I can add users to the gateway. But this, this, what I ever I do here will only allow people to use this gateway within the rest of the Power Platform, not in Power BI. <laughs> this is this is totally weird. But so just be aware of that. You know, if you want to prevent the administrator to to uh, to manage the gateway, you cannot do that unless you need to go in here and remove that person from the gateway here in here as well. If you want to prevent them, if you want to allow them to use the gateway and to manage it, you will need to go in here and you need to add them as an administrator to the gateway and then they can actually manage it. So it's a little little weird, but you know, uh, log logically, you know, it, 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 it makes sense because the Power BI administrator shouldn't, ne shouldn't necessarily administrate the gateway. It's very often, it's a separate service on a separate server on premise. So it's, it's usually you know, administrated by an infrastructure team or someone else, but very often, uh, you know, the Power BI administrator has the gateway as well because you know we you know we know Power BI. Nobody wants to know. Nobody wants to own Power BI things except us. So that's why we, we, we will get them all. So I just want I just wanted to point that out. Okay. So now I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and I'm gonna stop talking about the administrator, and I'm gonna start start talking about governance and I'm gonna go through a few slides on governance. Uh, and monitoring, um, and it's just I'm just gonna you know talk a little, uh, and then we're gonna uh, you know try to link it all together in the end. So, in my opinion, and this is only my opinion because there are a million opinions out there, power the, the governance in Power BI rests on four different pillars. You have processes because you need to make sure things are done properly. You have training because again you need to make things you need to make sure things are done properly. You have monitoring because you need to know what's going on and you have roles because you need to know who is responsible for what. So these are the pillars that are, you know, my governance uh, the strategy rests on. The processes are extremely important. And this is something that I that is totally undervalued in most organizations that I work with. You know, most organizations I work with, they start using Power BI and they just run with it. You know, the BI, the BI all the department and then, you know, uh, uh, business developers, they just start creating stuff and they go on and they do all the things they want to do. And what happens very often is that they don't even implement any kind of governance. And when that happens, you know, it's really hard to reel it back in. My experience is that if you decide to do governance from start, it's going to go well. If you do processes early on, people are going to accept them and they're going to embrace them because most business developers and a lot of BI developers that are maybe not used to work with Power BI, they want the guidance. Of course, you have to be aware of that. You cannot have a development process that is 55 pages you know, of heavy reading. That is no reason to do that. You know, my development process is you know four pages you know, of where, where you know two of them are standard stuff and two of them are actual content. Um, so it doesn't have to be big, and it just needs to be you know some 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 guidance into what you should be doing. 
and the same goes with publishing projects because people get insecure of you know how what should I do here you know should I have more than one workspace should I have you know test and production and development and you know, how should I do that having it written down will help everyone a lot and you know in many in organizations the the BI developer or the person doing Power BI will start out alone they will start developing everything but before you know it it's spread out and everyone is doing Power BI so doing this early is is really good the same thing about sharing. Um, I am a big fan of sharing through apps, um, but if you don't have any kind of a you know process on it, uh, people are going to be doing direct sharing back and forth, and it's going to be really, really, really hard to understand who has access to what. Uh, but doing apps and doing you know uh, AD groups, it's going to be really easy to understand you know who has access to what. Of course, talking about security and one of my favorites, naming standards, it's the most difficult thing to do, right? of everything you, you would think that security was the most difficult thing but naming is probably the most difficult thing it is horrible um, but you know having some kind of a naming standard will help uh, you just help people to search and help people know how to put things up because uh, otherwise it's gonna you know be random names all over the place and you're gonna have you know a tough time making it look nice again and support, uh, make sure your support uh, knows what to do, because if you work in a larger organization, they you know, might have a you know, support department or a support help desk or something like that. And if you don't tell them how to do Power BI, you know, maybe they just need to route it over to the right person, but at least they need to know that. You know, if they're not, you know, tickets come to die uh, in the support or in the help desk, and then and, and, and people get frustrated with Power BI and think it's a it's, it's bad thing because they don't get help. And the tenant setting, which I've covered before. Training is really important, and this is also a bit undervalued because people think, you know, well, Power BI Desktop, it's pretty easy to learn. There's no reason to have any kind of training. Just go on and do it. And yes, it is right, and you will be able to make it work. It will work well, but it will not work much better if you do training because people are going to be more effective. They're going to do best practices. Uh, and in my opinion, you should actually train also the end users. And I'm not talking about like a classroom training with you know three days of training. End users should just get some you know, small videos or manuals or something. Just tell them, how do I browse uh, the portal? How do I interact with a slicer? What is the filter pane? Just some small things like that to all the end users because then they're going to be much happier consumers of Power BI instead of you know, fiddling around and you know, understanding how to do, uh, how to work with the reports. And I really like to do uh, automate as much as I can. So what I uh, like to do with customers is to, you know, if they have kind of, you know, uh, the videos or manuals or some kind of off training offering is that, you know, if someone, you know, if I detect in the audit log that someone uses Power BI for the first time, send them an email with, you know, saying, hey, you should look at this material here. And if they created a content, you can send them, you know, hey, here's the governance process. Here is you know how you what you to be aware of, and here is a link to a uh, guy in the cube or uh, you know SQL BI channel or something you know where they can get more information on how to develop Power BI you know in the best way. So having things like that you know so you don't need to be manually calling people that you know that can help you a lot. But do training, train everyone, but you know train them in the right way. Don't you know spend the, all your training budget on training you know 50 end users when you can you know train your developers and and eat more easily train the end users with, with videos or something like that. Monitoring, of course, is a huge thing uh, when it comes to Power BI, uh, especially when you're talking about the administrator role. You should monitor Power BI. Uh, that is my absolute uh, you know, conviction. Uh, and when I talk about monitoring Power BI, there are two, you know, two legs to stand on in that. So one of them is to use the uh, audit log, which I talked about before. Taking the audit log out because it's only stored for a certain amount of time putting it into a database or a data lake or something, and then reporting on top of it. And the other one is to take uh, create an a inventory of all your artifacts. So a report catalog, uh, you know, workspace catalog and stuff like that. And then you can start you know, enriching this with all kinds of other data. So you can take the uh, you know, report catalog and enrich it with you know, sensitivity data or uh, you know, user information or like what department people are in. And then you mix it all together. So when you have a nice report of a, of the you know activities in your in your uh, you know in a tenant you can say you know these are activities and these are the people and they are in this department and you know this how this amount of so much of the reports are confidential and they have been read by these people and you can you know this is something where it's great value 
and there's also another great thing about you know harvesting the audit log and the and the artifact inventory is that you can also brag about how well you're go doing. You can flag on white show people that you know yes we are doing well we have so many users you know this report has been used by almost everyone in the company, and this can help you get funding and this can also help you just you know uh, get peace and quiet. Uh, it can help you uh, organize your uh, training activities and it can you know help you in so many ways. So I uh, always recommend that you actually do monitoring and you report on the results. So you might have a report on activities that is close to down to very few people. And then you have a report, which is uh, the report catalog, for example, which is open to everyone in the company because a user does not have, you know, does not know that a report exists unless they have explicit access to it. And this often causes a duplicate effort because, you know, re person A, you know, likes to have a report on, uh, you know, purchasing, but they don't know that user B has already created the report, so they create it again, and then they have, you know, maybe differences in the report. But having a report catalog, they can search it and see, oh, hey, there is already a report on on uh, on uh, uh, purchasing, and they can just request access to it, and then they have access, and then they can fight over why the differences are without having all the duplicate effort, of course. So this is my my recommendation to you as an administrator to to make sure that you harvest these things and you use them. And sure. there's a lot of information about you know, how to do it you know, online. So, and I can, I can point you in the right direction if you want. Yeah, it would be good to know like what kind of, uh, where and how can we create this kind of like a report catalog? I think it's something that I'm looking for as well. Yeah, so uh, what do you, what do you the, the way you do it is by you know, extracting the data using the REST API. That is the way you do it. And what I do is that I use, uh, you know, take the uh, the artifact inventory and I, I I just take a snapshot of everything I have every day. So all my workspaces, reports, dashboards, data sets, data sources, refresh schedule, export that every single day. And then I have like a snapshot that I can see the development of it. You know, am I getting more reports or fewer reports? Am I getting more workspaces and all that different? And that also has like who is the report owner and who has access to the workspaces and different things there. Then you take the audit log. So this is all your activities, and then you mix it all together. The mixing is, you know, uh, well, the data model is maybe the hardest part. But I have, uh, I, can, I can share with all this. Uh, uh, I have done some talks on uh, on uh, how to extract all this data, and I can point you to those those places, and I can maybe give you some some links as well when I share yeah. the share the, uh, the the slides as well. Yeah, I think that would be great. Thank you. Welcome. Yeah, <clears throat> one question from my side. Yeah. Uh, what, what do you think uh, about uh, Power Platform Center of Excellence Started Kit? Could it be also part of uh, Power BI governance? Well, you would need to develop it. You know that part of it. I really like the the toolkit, uh, the Start Kit, uh, you know, the uh, Center of Excellence Toolkit. It is really you know a smart solution. Um. And I have used it. You know, I have uh, seen it used you know, really, really effectively. I would love for something like that to be you know, available for Power BI as I just you know, install. Uh, I have actually been thinking about if I can pro you know, create a product like that, but you know, it, is, it is really, really hard to do. Um, so at the moment, you know, if you want to do add Power BI to that, you would need to program that part of it. Of course, collect the data and then program that part. But it, behind the scenes, it's doing exactly what you would be doing in Power BI, except for the rest of the Power Platform. That is, you know, it is a little bit, you know, Power BI and the rest of the Power Platform. It is they are a little bit separate, unfortunately. So the last part of uh, of the my you know governance uh, strategy is to have defined roles. Um, I think it's really important to define roles, and it's just made, there are two reasons why you would do it. One is that so people understand who has responsibility for different things. Who are the is the administrator? Who is the gateway administrator? Who is the auditor? Who's the supporter? Data steward is maybe not Power BI related, but it's still something that is important. I think when it comes to Power BI. And the other reason why you want to do this is to uh, allow those people actually to spend time on that, you know, because very often the Power BI administrator is an accidental administrator. It's just the best BI developer in the company, and they just become an administrator. Um, but if you have that hat on, you know, you have been designed this hat. They all people, uh, companies also forced to give you resources to work on it. 
I cannot just say that you need to do 100% work on something else. Otherwise, you cannot fulfill that role. But it, because it's not really defined often, people are just expected to do that besides their, their normal work. So definitely uh, try to define them and then you know, if, you know, hopefully get a you know, fixed allocation. But if not fixed allocation, at least a recognition that it is, does take some effort. And just just a couple of things about the uh, about the monitoring. I just want to. I have just added three slides here just to uh, just to give you an idea about the monitoring because I know this is really really important. I know you know by the questions also this is something that you're really interested in. Um, so when I'm talking about these two things, the artifact inventory and the activities. Uh, when we talk about artifact inventory, we are talking about what exists and what has changed. So a snapshot every day of workspaces, reports, dashboard, data sets, data sources, and gateways, for example. And then uh, for the activities, we are you know taking about you know who is using Power BI and who is not using Power BI. That tells you about the adoption. And then of course, who is viewing? What are they viewing? When did they view it? And then you know you can you know start doing things like uh, looking at specific reports or specific data sets. You know who has access to them? You uh, know what are the data sources we used and stuff like that. And the activities is fairly simple because it's only one API endpoint. It will give you everything. It's a little bit different, difficult maybe to, to work with the data afterwards, but it's really simple to get. The REST API to get the, data, the artifact inventory is a little bit diff more difficult because you need to you know, point to a, at least four or five endpoints to get what you really want. Um, but it's still not nothing, you know, overly uh, difficult. If you have any kind of, you know, I, ha I had no really no experience working with the REST APIs, but I still managed to do it. So it's something that, you know, I think most people can if they, if they if they put their mind to it. So this is how my architecture normally looks when we are talking about monitoring. Um, I take data, if I start on the left, I take data from the REST API for the artifact inventory. I take data from the activity log to get you know, all the activities. I normally use PowerShell, but you can also build your own web application. Um, the main thing is that you need to use the REST API. If you're gonna get data from the you know, Office 65 security and compliance under, you just you're you're still using uh, the office management uh, REST API instead of using the Power BI admin API to get the activities, but it's still it's still the same concept. It's just different API. What I normally do, and this is not mandatory, is I output everything that comes from the uh, from these uh, REST API calls. I output it into a file storage as JSON files because it, it, you know you can of course if you're good at PowerShell you can you know manipulate the data into uh, tabular structures but I just output them as a PowerShell as a JSON files and then I have an archive of you know of everything that I have ever gotten then I use uh, some kind of integration tool to to pick up those files put them into a database of course I do some kind of a cleaning and transformation of the data to make it you know into a data warehouse structure and then I use Power BI on top. Of course, we are talking Power BI. So, so this is this is my the, the way I normally do this. Um, but there, are, of course, there are many other ways to do it. And you can do a cloud way, or you can do on premise. It doesn't matter. Uh, the, you know, depending on what kind of tools you like to use, what kind of integration tools you like, you know, what kind of schedulers you like to use, or uh, orchestrators. And, yeah. But you, you know, this is just normally how I do it. Okay. So. This was my talk. I have uh, I have some uh, uh, contact information here on the slide, so you are well free, more than welcome to get in touch. What I will do is that I will uh, I will add some more links to this to point you in our resources for uh, for Power BI monitoring, and I will send it to Aldis, and he will post post it in the group, uh, and then you can you know then you can see that you know it, it will probably not be tonight, but maybe tomorrow. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, maybe some question uh, questions, yep. so you, yep. Yep. you could write in chat. And maybe before questions, could you give us a short uh, description about your company? What are you doing? What's like? What what kind of services you're providing? And maybe what the situation? What clients are requesting the most? Uh, what what's on 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 the top like? Yeah. So. I am. I am. Uh, I have my own company, and I'm just just myself. Uh, my company is called North Insights. I do uh, uh, Power BI and Azure BI mostly. So everything is cloud based at the moment. At least you know most of. It. I have clients that are on premise. Clients that are using Power BI Report Server. Clients that are using Analysis Services on premise. But uh, you know most of it is in the cloud at the moment. Uh, I am 
doing a lot of work uh, at the moment on advisory on Power BI. So how do you should you architect it? Monit monitoring is a big thing as well. I, I have a solution there that it's which I just sell to to customers. You know, they just buy the solution and I come and implement it, and then I go away and they they have it there. Um, and then uh, I am doing a, quite a bit of uh, uh, issue data factory and then all some some you know data warehousing in the cloud as well. Um, one of the things also I, I'm do, I have been doing for a while is do training. I do a lot of Power BI training and and and, uh, and, and you know analysis services and uh, Azure data training as well. And that's something that I really really enjoy. So these are these are the these are the things that I, um, I'm doing, and and my, this is what my customers are uh, are asking for. It's either a pure development, or it's it, it's more of an advisory or training, you know, capabilities that they're looking for. And you know, we all know that there is a there is a shortage of people. Um, so uh, training people and getting them up to speed is something that you know that I'm really passionate about. Yeah, you you must have a lot of job, <laughs> a lot of work. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm I'm not I'm not uh, I'm not complaining. Uh, I have I have enough to do. Uh, although you know, it's 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 it, when you're a consultant, you never know what's going to happen tomorrow. So that's 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 one of the fun thing about it. That's right. And we see your lovely family here. Yeah. Yeah. Right. This is a, I have a one I have a one more actually. I I had a, a new daughter in the last June, so I need to update the pictures. Uh, <laughs> with a, so I have a 15-year-old and 12-year-old, and then uh, you know a seven-month-old. Nice. Uh, okay. Uh, yep. One question. Uh, question. Um, uh, how how could you advise to spot the performance killers in Power BI Premium? Like uh, we can see which reports are the most used, uh, how many users are looking at them, but actually we don't see what, who is taking the most capacity or using the most. Uh, uh, the resources of, of, of the and have you have you tried the uh, the premium capacity metrics app um, this is the one which uh, the, by default uh, shows the yeah so it's, it's, it's the one uh, so if you're in power bi if you go to apps one apps yeah so this is the power bi premium capacity metrics app if you if you install this it, it's going to tell you uh, it's going to tell you, you know, slower inquiries. It's going to focus on CPU or, or, or uh, you know, or memory. And it's going to tell you about refreshes and you know, how things are clashing. And so it's really interesting. You know, it should give you uh, most of the things about performance of premium capacity. Where does does it get the data from? This uh, capacity app. It does get the data from the from the uh, Azure stack that it's running on. You know, uh, you cannot do anything about it. What you, if you when you have installed this app, you will get a data set. And a report in your in a workspace of your choosing, and then you can yeah. do whatever reporting you want. You get a you know a, like a standard report, but you can do whatever reporting you want on top of the data set. You cannot uh, change the data set. You can change the data set. You know you have it. You can open it in Power BI Desktop, uh, but oh. you cannot you know get any other data because it's just a fixed data set that, that they have. You know they have created Microsoft, but it's getting getting metrics data from the underlying Azure uh, uh, you know machines. Oh. So it's not something you can get to yourself. There's no way for yourself to build anything. Yeah, no, this is the unfortunate because uh, internally, uh, Power BI Premium, we have one node currently in a whole company. Yeah. And we, ha we have this uh, idea of splitting the cost between the teams. Like yeah. for example, if, if there is Power BI Team 1 and Power BI Team 2, yeah. and one is kind of uh, making reports which will like use like 80% of capacity, yeah. we would like them to kind of uh, internally like kind of pay uh, this eighty yep. percent, but this is uh, no like I, as I understand there is something in this uh, yeah, second but, generation, um, but uh, in the yeah. uh, current one uh, not, we haven't found anything good. <laughs> so. No, there, there is there is nothing you can find not in the app either uh, in or in the data set. Nothing that can give you any conclusive, you know. Uh, so so. so you can of course you know you can of course in the in the metrics app you can see which are the biggest data sets how often they are you know, you know uh, processed and that is often how people try to uh, you know split the cost you know you use it what's capacity so then you are you know uh, you you have a you know eight gigabytes you know okay let's say let's, let's be fair you have seven you know, 700 megabytes uh, a data set uh, and you refresh it every hour uh, so you use this much you know uh, of the capacity 
Uh, so we will call, we will accommodate or put cost on you for that. But there is no exact science, and there's nothing you can do to really find anything good about it. You could mix it with, you know, usage as well. But you know, again, it's it's very hard to, because is it the you know import data set or directory data set, and there's all kind of factors that you cannot really, you know. So you your best bet is to find a model and then stick to it. Oh. Um, and then just don't tell them that you know it's imperfect, <laughs> because then they start to you know, complaining that they're paying too much. And and also with governance, this is one of the problems that uh, it's quite expensive to have this uh, capacity. And then uh, like currently also like everything test uh, production acceptance test everything happens in in the same same place. Yeah. And uh, like as long as you don't have these separate uh, capacities for test and production, there is no way how to kind of limit like some user want just to test and uh, basically uh, mm -hmm. top management who is viewing the report <laughs> is complaining about slow performance. And, yeah. Um, yeah. So, so mo most most you know customers I have and work works with they 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 use you know just you know shared capacity for development. And, and then they don't put it into premium unless it's uh, you know a, a user receptor test or if it's you know if it's end, you know end for end user production basically. Um, so they because you know developers are, you need to have a pro license anyway. Um, so so then then you can you know you don't have to you know it, it uses less of the capacity. But then you know the solution of Microsoft Points of course you just buy another capacity and that's production you know and and then you pay five thousand dollars more a month. That's uh, that's always good, but you know, premium per user might be a uh, a solution to this, uh, because it 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 will it will uh, it will you know maybe give you a similar capabilities for less cost, or of course the Gen two of uh, of premium which will use the capacity better, use the uh, resources better, but you know you need to we need to test that properly before you can say that it will work for your scenario. Yeah, we have another. We we have a question. Yep. About um, we have issues with report refreshes. There are several on same time, and they do not finish. Uh, refresh cause the resource is over. Can I can I that find the capacity metrics app to find out what happens and where the problem is? Only if you have Power BI Premium. If you don't have Power BI Premium then your only option is to monitor the source. Um, so if you if you are if the source is on premise, you can you know you, can, you should monitor the gateway and see what's happening on the gateway. Um, if the, your source is in the cloud, you would need to try to you know monitor and capture the queries on the on the, in that you know in that where they where you're pointing them. But it's only in the premium capacity you can see uh, the good stuff. Uh, so unfortunately you would need to build it yourself if you if you're if you don't have premium capacity. Okay, thank you. Okay, any more questions or? I think uh, so. It's good you answered it already. The record amount of questions. So thank <laughs> you so much. You're welcome. Yeah. So I, I'm I'm saying saying thank you to you and uh, uh, hope we will have you. Uh, uh, Ho hopefully, I can come to uh, to Riga next time. That would be perfect. Yeah, that would be a perfect. <laughs> maybe not not uh, like in first half of this year. But ah, maybe. Not, yeah, maybe next. You know, next uh, autumn or next year. So let's yes, say let's, yes. let's say that. Yeah. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, be in yep. touch. Thank you, everyone, for uh, for coming. It would be great to have you. Good to be here. Thanks oh. and bye bye. Bye bye.